Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. There is a particular biblical process clearly laid out through, throughout Scripture of our Lord's calling us to Himself, uh, to Him being glorified, you know, from A to Z. It's always been of great interest to me to try to better understand that process. The first mistake that we make when we start thinking about that sort of thing is, is that this process depends upon us, that it comes from us, that in fact, really, it is, it's our process. It's, it's not God's process. And so I need to say right up front, I need, I need to stress the importance of the fact that this is God's process. Now, I'll quickly go through this as I understand it and then make some comments on it. We are, as Christians, we, God's children, we are called. The word called is used in reference to our Father through the Holy Spirit, calling us into a relationship with Him. It begins on that basis. How are we called? Uh, does God call us on the telephone? No, he, he calls us through His Word. That's where it begins. Now, this results in something, and that is... It, our hearing God. We hear. God's sheep hear His voice. The Lord's sheep hear His voice. We hear Him. Why, why do we hear Him? Because we are His. We don't become His by hearing. It's a, po a popular misconception that we become children of God by something that we do. And that is just not true. So He calls us through His Word, which results in hearing. And that word hearing is the same word as the word obedience. We have become obedient unto the faith. The word obedience is hupakuo. The word here is akuo. So you have the word here, which is akuo, and upakuo, which is an intense form of the Greek word here. It, it's a modified, intense form of the word, which literally means under the hearing of another. This then leads to Holy Spirit enlightenment. He enlightens us to the truth of His Word. God shines the truth of His Word to our heart, our hearts. But it doesn't stop there. The process doesn't stop there. There is a reason and a purpose for every step in this, in this stage of our development, this process, which I'm going to, I'm going to call the uh, a biblical process of our Lord's calling us at the beginning which results ultimately in, in Him being glorified, which is, I, I'm going to call that the end result. After we're enlightened by the Holy Spirit, now we need, we need faith. And this is not something that we muster up on our own. Based upon that enlightenment, based upon that calling and, and that hearing, and in our being obedient, which we're going to be because we are His sheep, it leads to enlightenment and it leads to the, the investment of faith. God invests faith in our lives. It's an investment. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
Faith is an integral part of our lives in Christ, our walk, uh, and even our work, as we'll see. Naturally, shouldn't be too hard to imagine that what follows that investment of faith is a trial, a testing of that faith. It's not the Christian that's tested. Uh, that's another mi popular mis misconception. Uh, God is testing me. No, He's not testing you. He's testing your faith. This is, keep in mind, this is faith that God gave you After He has tried us, tested us, God says that we shall, not might, but we shall come forth as gold. This then leads to faith exercised. We actually exercise the faith that God gave us that we didn't muster up on our own, which came through the Word of God, which was an investment by God in our lives. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Many Christians focus on the sin aspect of their lives, but you're focused, if you do that, you're focused on an area in which God never in, has, He hasn't invested faith in your life to trust Him concerning the truth of the Word of God in, in some particular area of your lives. And it needs pointed out that we, each one of us are different. We are on different levels of spiritual growth. We've been a Christian uh, uh, at for different lengths of time than, than others. Some, of, some are new Christians, some are older Christians. They've been Christians for 75, 80 years. Some, some people have been Christians for 75 or 80 minutes. I mean, this, this is God's work. And He knows what He's doing in the lives of His people. And it sort of behooves us to to learn to trust in Him and His timing, His direction, and His guidance. And so this leads to uh, faith being exercised in our life, which faith exercised, e I'm going to tell you that faith exercised equals the righteousness of God on an experiential level in our lives. That God credits to our account, righteousness, which is based on faith, which Paul speaks abundantly about in the epistle to the Romans. It's a righteousness of God that's based on faith. Now, this is where it gets interesting because this leads to Christ manifest. Christ himself manifest in and through our lives. Why? Because it's His righteousness. We don't have any of our own. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. This also leads to the fruit of the Spirit. All those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And I've often suggested, I'll, I'll remind you again, what I firmly believe is that if one of those characteristics is missing, none are there. If one is there, they're all there. It, it, it comes as a, as a package. You know, it is, God does not hand out these characteristics, grant these characteristics separate from righteousness. Righteousness produces those characteristics, and if, and if one is present, they're all there. If one is missing, 
None are there. And this, of course, leads to Christ being glorified. Glorified. When we talk about the word glorified, we're talking the word glory. Literally, the word glory means a proper estimation of, of something's value or worth. And this is what we're doing when we're glorifying God. We're attributing to Him a proper estimation of His value, of His worth. Now, to be fair, the world religious system, based on human merit, only has the wrong view of, well, just about all of it. Now, I understand that's a bold statement to make, but it is absolutely a fact that modern Christianity today has the wrong view of this process, because mainly because they think that the Christian is the one who initiates the process, who, who has established the process in his or her own Christian life, and that it is absolutely completely up to the Christian to sanctify himself, to set himself or herself apart for service to God, by what they do, by their actions, when, that, when nothing could be further than the truth. We are sanctified in truth. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that the world religious system just basically has the wrong view of just about all of it because it's built on that which is fleshly and carnal, not spiritual. The focus is on self, not Christ. We know from Romans chapter 8, the mind of the flesh, that is law, basically. Uh, scripture uses flesh in relationship to law very often in the Word. We, we see the connection between flesh and law. The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit, life and peace. Romans 8, 6. The, the focus, dearly beloved, is on things below, not on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the God, His work is finished. That's why He's seated. And so sadly, our focus today, the focus on, of most Christians today, in the main, is on sin, self, law, the world, Satan, and death. The fear of death. All of which the Christian, whether he realizes it or not, has died to. Death has separated us from all of that. But Steve, Pastor Steve, who cares? I mean, who cares, really? I mean, uh, it's, not, it's not important. Learning all of that is just too hard. Dearly beloved, a fifth grader could learn this process in just a few school days. Well, Steve, we won't understand all of that until we step into eternity. Sorry. All right, it's going to be too late then. There will be no need for that process in eternity. It only has relevance to the present time. There is coming a day, dearly beloved, where I will not need faith. Some of you will quickly understand that. 
how, how true that is. There will be no need for faith in heaven. This is God's process. It's His work. And it is all according to His timing, not yours. And that has relevance to your own life as well as the lives of others that, that you have to deal with. It's not your place to try to make that according to your timing in your life or in, in the life of someone else. Problem is, we ignore the reality of it all and we tend to pursue maturity as if it were a process of our own. That's law. And it is precisely that law that results in our wishing, oh, how we wish, wishing that we had what God says we've already been given. Can you imagine the, the myriad of prayers that go up daily beseeching God to do something for us that He clearly says He's already done. I think one of the greatest tragedies in this whole spectrum of Christianity, this whole idea of, Christ, of the Christian life, is that we beseech God to do something for us that God has clearly already done, that we should know that He's done. Then if we did know, we wouldn't beseech Him. It, the beseeching Him to do something like that would be replaced quickly, replaced with thanksgiving and praise and glory. It is precisely that law that results in our wishing that we had what God says we've already been given. Oh, I wish, Steve. Oh, I wish I had assurance. God's given you that. Well, Steve, you can't say that. He has not given me assurance. Why are you telling me God's given me assurance? I ought to know if I got assurance or not. The reason I can say that, dearly beloved, is because God's Word says that. Just because you don't experience it doesn't mean God hasn't given it. Oh, Steve, I wish I, had, I wish I was forgiven. You are. You have been. If you're, if you're a Christian and you're waiting to be forgiven, I just, I don't really, I hardly know what to tell you. We have been, past time, forgiven. Oh, Steve, I don't feel forgiven. Well, there, there's your problem. You're walking by feelings, not by faith. Oh, Steve, I wish I had peace. Oh, man, if I just had peace. If I had more peace. I just need more peace. You know, I just need... I... My peace I leave you, he said. Dearly beloved, you have His peace. You have it. The, the problem is, is, is not that you don't... that You need something that you don't have. The problem is, is that you, you have something you don't know about. Oh, Steve, I wish I could stop sinning. So does every saint, all right? But that's not going to happen until He delivers our bodies. He re our bodies are redeemed once and forever, finally redeemed, and we're freed from this old sinful nature which can do nothing but sin. Well, Steve, I, I, I wish I was more happier more blessed. I guess it doesn't do much good for me to tell, go around telling people the truth all the time that they've been blessed, you know, Christians, God's people, that they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. I, the problem is, is not that you need to be more blessed. The problem is that you need to realize how blessed you are.
maybe you're starting to get this. The, the Christian life, the Bible's not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. The Bible is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ who made these things true. It asks you to believe it. To believe Him concerning these things. It's not, it's not like we believe in, in the things themselves. We believe in the God of those things. Oh, I wish I had more faith. We've, we've each been granted a measure of faith. Imagine how stupid, I'm sorry, I don't know of another word to use, that it would be if we all were on the same level and we all had the same faith. Uh, where would there even be any need for ministry? And if it's not any of that stuff, well, it's, or, you know, it's like uh, there's all those hopes, you know. Well, I, I hope, I hope God loves me. Well, you could say, you could throw that in with under the wish list. I wish God loved me. But, you know, I hope God loves me. I, hope, I just, oh, I sure hope God loves me. I don't see how he could, but I sure hope God loves me. He does. You're walking by sight, not by faith. Breaks my heart to think of Christians walking through this world, wishing, hoping God loves them when God clearly does. Oh, I hope God's not angry with me. Surely, Steve, surely, Pastor Steve, God gets angry at you, at, at you, at, at us at times. I mean, he's not totally pleased with us all the time. I, I beg to differ. We have been accepted in the beloved. God is fully pleased with us. That satisfaction is seen that God has for us, that He's fully satisfied, is seen in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our, in our place. Where God is propitiated. We don't have to propitiate. We don't have to satisfy, do something to satisfy some angry God, to appease an angry God. God is fully pleased with you only because you're in Christ. Well, Steve, I just hope I make it to heaven. I can't figure out why so many Christians. I, I, I'm, I'm t I just scratch my head, folks. I, you're, you've been a Christian for 50 years and you're hoping you're going to heaven when, when, when that should have been settled day one. The sad fact. And it is sad, is that today, many, many Christians, I, I'm tempted to say most, I'll, I'll just, I'll keep it to, to many. Christians, they believe that God can at times not love you, uh, be angry with you, not forgive you, and send you to hell if you don't do what he says, none of which are true. None. None of that's true. Christians today, they unknowingly, out of ignorance, they suffer from a crisis of insecurity. There is an identification problem crisis, an identity crisis. I, you know, I imagine having an identity. It kind of reminds me of uh, other things, topics I don't want to get into where you just, you don't properly identify who you are. Identification on any level is, is crucial. It's vital. It's important. It's, we, we treat it as important. In fact, we consider it vital, so necessary. 
You know, the, there's identification of, of living persons. You know, if you're alive, you, you, need, you need an ID, okay? You know, deceased persons, they get a toe tag. I mean, you know, their ID, they, you know, we, we identify properties, we identify uh, land, borders, uh, we identify, or we should, gender-wise, you know, we, we identify uh, groups, uh, we, we identify good versus evil, we, it's, the identification is used of believers, uh, or another person, or, or no one, you know, we, we can't identify this person, and, and so on and so forth. There's tangible IDs that are involved, uh, passports, driver's licenses, facial voice recognition, photographs, the dictionary itself identifies words and terms. We place tremendous value on the word identification, especially in the present age, except when it comes to Christianity. You know, the opposite, if you looked at the opposite, the anonyms of, of identification is anonymity, anonymity, namelessness, obscurity, inconspicuousness, secrecy, unrecognizability. Who likes that stuff? If you go through the dictionary and you look at all the ways that the, uh, the word identification is used, all of the contexts uh, in which it's used, it's used to establish or make a determination on the nature of someone or something. Uh, to have a strong connection with something or someone. To consider or regard somebody or something as something or the other. To draw an association between two or more things. To, to, to come to an awareness of something, to identify or select something from a range of options, to identify or, or find, especially with great accuracy or precision, uh, to feel, notice, or detect with one's senses, uh, to be a sign or a symbol of something, to attach a label to something, to identify from a knowledge of appearance or, or character, to, to choose or select, uh, one thing or another, to, to be an identifying characteristic or a mark of something, to, to give a specified name or description to something, to, to mention as an example or a reference to something. Dearly beloved, it's, it's a big word. It's a big word. It's a huge word, identification. And much of our understanding of the Christian life is based on that one word. It, it's the tragedy of all tragedies to, to mislabel something. To, you're, in effect, lying when you do that. You need to understand what something is. You need to properly identify something, anything, no matter what it is. Well, that's a rattlesnake, and that's, that's one that's got venom, and it's venomous, it'll kill you, and that's one that won't. I mean... It, A lot of different uses to mark passages of or specific text as a means of memorizing for future reference, to mention as an example or a reference, to ascertain through analysis or investigation, to form or have a close personal relationship with someone or something, to uh, designate a particular name or title, to sort or divide into classes or categories. The word, the meanings, the context of that, how that word's used just goes on and on and on. And yet, Christians today, pulpits in particular, and other pastors, to a great extent, don't seem to be concerned much about even talking about identification and the importance of identification. So it seems kind of stupid to not talk about identification when it comes to Christianity, but in fact we do, and it's called baptism, dearly beloved.
baptism. The only baptism that saves us today is spiritual, not the symbolic. Getting baptized in water doesn't make you a Christian any more than putting on a cowboy hat makes you a cowboy. We have been identified with Christ. Do you, under, do you really understand what that means? He came into this world without sin. We are made a new creation, creation in Christ. We have a new nature that cannot sin. When He died, we died with Him. We was buried with Him. We rose from the dead with Him. We have been so closely identified with our Lord and Savior that it staggers the imagination. It staggers the mind. If more Christians just understood how closely they have been identified with Christ, they wouldn't face all the problems that they do. That'd be the problems they would face would be of a different kind. It's his work, it's not ours. We haven't identified ourselves with Christ. We have been identified with Christ. We have been baptized. Aren't you aware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, that's not because of something that you did, were baptized into His death. His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may what? Walk in newness of life. Not in oldness of the letter. Law. For if we've been united with Him like this in His death, which we have, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. If you feel like you're a slave to sin living under law, well, your feelings are quite accurate. I mean, that's, that's what happens under law. The problem is, is you're not under law, you're under grace. Anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Romans 6, 7. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. The death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. So you too must reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. First command given you in Romans. The gateway into life, dearly beloved, genuine life in Christ is remarkably, astoundingly, it's something that we don't typically, Christians don't typically think about. The gateway into life, folks, is death. Death. It's, it's like the seed we place in the ground. The seed is a, is a living seed, but it dies. We don't, we don't place a, a dead seed in the ground which comes to life. We place a living seed in the ground which dies and as a result of that death, it brings forth fruit of its own kind. That's how nature works. Same with you and I. In fact, we're made of the very dirt that the seed goes in. But we don't like the concept of death. Not in any shape, form, or fashion. We don't like talking about it. We don't like thinking about it. It's just too, uh, too ugly a, a, a concept to think about. Death. I mean, death is death. Is death. It's not a, not a fun topic. But when you come over into the our area of, of our Christian life, it is a remarkably enlightening fact that we have been crucified with Christ. 
No, we don't like the concept of death in, in, in this context, partly because we don't understand how life can spring forth out of death, though the concept of it surrounds us everywhere. You know, on earth and in the heavens above. Or if we do understand it, it scares us. And no wonder death removes human merit from the equation altogether. Forcing us to have to trust in the one that we've been crucified with. And failure on our part to understand this one simple principle of life out of death is, is, is what causes us to be, as Paul said in Ephesians, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men with cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Any human merit-based religion, I don't care what it is, especially that which poses as authentic Christianity thrives on what God calls cleverly devised fables. Cleverly devised fables. We find that in 2 Peter 1.16. In the first chapter, of 2 Peter, we read Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith. It's, it's something we all share. With us through the righteousness of God, that's not our own filthy rags righteousness, and our Savior Jesus Christ, we're, we're not our own Savior, grace and peace. Folks, grace doesn't just step in when you fail. Okay, I mean, you know, God's got some little grace off to the side here waiting for you when you don't match up to what you're supposed to be. It, it, it doesn't step in when you fail. It's, it's the foundation of our deliverance. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Not, not the knowledge of ourselves, not the knowledge of our own ability. According as His divine power, that's not our own strength, hath given unto us all things, all things, not some things, but all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are, give, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, what? The promises. By these you might be partakers of the divine nature. We want to we want to become partakers of the divine nature by something other than God's promises. That you might be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, live as the saints we actually are. Having already escaped the corruption that is in the world, that is, the world religious system, through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That is, not create it, but realize it. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. I kind of like to think that's what I'm doing now. Though ye know them, 
Well, how do you know them? Well, because God said them. And be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. We are going to see that in our survey of Acts this Sunday concerning Paul. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. That was a work God did in Paul's life. Through the Word of God, he used Paul to complete the Word of God. For we have, and this is it, verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty, for He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Did you know that the Father has never said that about anyone else ever? God is pleased with you only because you are in His Son. That's the basis of His satisfaction for you. You stand in the merit of Christ in what He did. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the Holy Mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy wherein unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. This is what we're going through. And until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Dearly beloved, the Word of God, not our own assumptions, not our own imaginations, not our own interpretations, is what directs us, guides us, teaches us, controls us, grows us, and sustains us. Blessings and peace as we await our Lord's appearing to take us home.